What I want to do tonight is to focus on uh, focus on one of the most surprising features of the modern world. There's a paradox of the modern world that is everywhere that you look. On the one hand, we're spectacularly successful as a species. If you were a baby as uh, yet unborn and you could pick only the time that you were going to be born, but not where or to whom in the world, you could not do better than pick right now. On almost every possible measure of human success that has to do with our fundamental biological success, physical success, we are actually doing spectacularly well. People today are more likely to live a long life, regardless of country. Yeah, there's disparities, but the floor has come up. You're less likely to starve. You're less likely to die violently, to be the victim of a war. You're much less likely to have an infectious disease, and if you have an illness, you're much more likely to be able to recover from it. And of course, we have modes of information, education, communication, transportation, that just in the last few decades are unimaginable before that time. If you think about what people would have been struggling with 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 300 years ago, this is a story of amazing success. And they're usually linked to the biological and physical technologies that we've developed. But at the same time, at the very same time, if you had to pick a time when you were most likely to struggle with anxiety or depression, that you're most likely to have an eating disorder, if you're an 18-year-old today, your likelihood of having anxiety, depression, or, level, or high levels of stress or a full standard deviation above what it was just 30 years ago. Meaning, what was abnormal 30 years ago is the norm now. And it's not just self-report. It's not that said the kids are learning to say, oh, woe is me. You can see it even in the physical impact of stress. The rates of eating disorders, suicide, drug problems, chronic pain. Have you noticed on the television they have ads for the side effects of the opiates for chronic pain? On main channels? Just do the math as to how much it costs to pay for that commercial for the side effect of the medication for the chronic pain. Something is wrong. How can you put these two things together? How could both be true? The claim that I want to make is that they come from the same root. Some of these statistics are almost unbelievable. You may not believe them, but they are so. And you have to grapple with how can they be so. You look around you and you see it in your families, in your communities. Is there a, a, a group that you know that hasn't been visited by psychological problems, by addiction, that, where you know that family well? What I want to claim is that behavioral science hasn't kept up with biological and physical science, that we haven't been giving the kind of solutions that we need, but that we have identified now a number of things that I want to bring to you out of our work and work that's related to it. But the bottom line of it in terms of where those problems come, the claim I want to make is they come from the same place. These are two sides of the same thing. The same skills that give us the iPhones or the solutions to disease, some of those same skills are the ones that give us human misery amidst plenty. A combination that is hard to imagine hundreds of years ago. 
Another claim I want to make is you already know this. You already know, actually, what behavioral science is saying are the most powerful ways that you can step up to this fundamental paradox. You know it from your wisdom traditions and spiritual and religious traditions. You know it from your family traditions and larger cultural traditions. But not just that, the argument I'm gonna make is that you know it because the answers to this paradox are built into human consciousness itself. But here's a problem. You know it, but your mind doesn't. Your analytic, judgmental, problem-solving mind does not have a clue, and in fact is at the root of these two paradoxal growths. We're feeding one aspect of us at the cost of the whole of us. And unless we can learn to be wiser about that, this split is gonna continue. This almost mockery of progress is gonna continue. Now, I think I can actually prove that to you, that you know something that your mind doesn't know. Because the logical, reasonable, and sensible things you do when you're struggling with this second zone of problems are being fed by the analytical, judgmental mode of mind, and yet there's a greater wisdom within. Here's what I need in order to make this case. I need something that you're struggling with. Even if you're doing quite well psychologically, I need a little connection because if we're gonna talk about stress and so forth, we can't be talking about the people over there. We gotta be out talking about the people here, the people that you see in the mirror. And so here's what I want you to start with. I'd like you to start with some kind of difficult feeling or memory or urge or motion or thought. And ideally something that has all those features. There's a judgmental piece of it, that place where you get down on yourself and it's two in the morning and you're thinking, I am, and then there's a word there that isn't very pleasant. And there's an emotion or a memory that comes to it, something that is a psychological struggle that you know about. And what I want you to do is to find something like that that's heavy and sticky and has those features. Some insecurity or anxiety or sadness or memory or sense of shame, something. And I want you to put it into your hand and raise it. You're not gonna have to share it, it's safe. But by raising it, what you're saying is I'm a human being who has something like that. I know about that, I've got one of those. You got one? Okay, now leave your hand up. I'll tell you when you can take it down. Leave it up. You can take it down if whatever's in your hand showed up only in the last year, but before that it didn't exist at all. Otherwise, your hand has to stay up. You can take it down if it showed up in the last two years, didn't exist before that, but otherwise you need to leave your hand up. If it's older than five years, you need to leave your hand up. Otherwise, you can put your hand down. Start glancing around. If it's older than 10 years, leave your hand up. If you can find the beginnings of it, even before you were age 18 in the developmental period, maybe not exactly like that, but you remember where this started, thoughts like that go all the way back to before, leave your hand up, now look around the room. We're the successful people. <laughs> now you put your hand up. How is that possible? that the things that penetrate us, that hurt us, can last and last and last. I bet some of you thought of something that goes all the way back to when you were this high. We need to look at why this paradox of the modern world is there and look honestly at our own heads and hearts but also at the power that we have within that science is showing is actually so. So we're gonna do some things in here. I'm gonna challenge you a little bit in here. We're gonna try some different things. I'm gonna ask you to, if you're willing to go with me. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm gonna push you beyond your limit. But I want you to look at 
what's up with that and is there anything we can do about that? But I want to start with this wisdom within. I'm going to come at this in a couple ways over the evening, but I want to start with this. Take what was in your hand, that issue, and then with your eyes closed, because I'm going to ask you to do something that would be embarrassing. They're not filming you, they're filming me. We're safe. And uh, I'll see you, but that's okay. I'll, I need to. Here's what I want to do. I want you to imagine that you are like a magnificent sculpture. I mean, you are just world class. And the thing that you're sculpting is your own body. And so I want you to sculpt your body in such a way that if someone were to come by, you know, like there's a sculpture garden out there and there's plants and stuff, and they would see that, they'd go, oh. And they'd have an idea of what it's like to be you at your worst with what you had in your hand. In other words, I want you metaphorically to put in physical form what it's like to be you at your worst. And what I mean by at your worst is when this thing gets most dominant, when it pushes you around, when it's really hardest, when things are going backwards. So close your eyes so nobody has to see and just put your body physically in a position. I'll even close mine, I'll just do it. It's totally private here now. It's only you inside your skin and put yourself in a position that would reflect you at your worst, metaphorically. Now you can come up and sit normally. And now I want you to do the same thing. This one, is it okay if we leave our eyes open? We're usually a little less ashamed about this one. You might be a little embarrassed about using your body. But I want you to sculpt your body into a position that shows you at your best, at your most empowered, as your most successful, because sometimes this issue is less impactful and sometimes more, this thing that was in your hand. Would you be willing to do that? Can we do it eyes open? Is it okay so you can see what's around you? Show me with your body, you at your best, metaphorically, so that I'd understand it and glance around a little bit. Just glance around at what you're seeing. And now you can sit down. We're doing research on this across cultures. We have hundreds of pictures of people around the world. We've asked this same question. And by the way, it's, it's not very cultural. I've got a little thing on my desk, that one on the bottom right. It's a little sculpture that was given to me by Kara Bunning, who got her PhD with me. And as her gift to me, after receiving her degree, is she gave me that little carving. And the artist named it Human Suffering. You can't look at that one on the bottom right and not know this is a human being at their worst. And the kinds of pictures we get when we ask people around the world, we've done it in Iran, we've done it in Europe, it doesn't matter. They have these features and see, I, I was close, I wasn't watching you. But see if something didn't happen, when you thought about it, you might have folded down a little bit. You brought your arms and hands in. Your head came down. I asked you to close your eyes, but if I hadn't, they would have closed then. You might have even covered your hands. You might have moved towards almost a fetal position. You with me of this? Conversely, when we did the one we could see, you saw stuff like that. Your head came up, your eyes were open, your hands were out and they're free, they weren't like so. You might have even had a broader stance. What does that mean? You're expressing something. You've noticed there are times when things are going better and times when they're not, and you can express it, it's a physical metaphor. Well, I think it has some things in there. It looks to me, like you're more open versus closed. That you're defended and protecting. If you're attacked by a bear or a dog or something, you're gonna do that. It's almost as if these struggles are attacking you. Or I'm open. In this posture, you can get at my soft underbelly. My hands are out where they can move. I can do things. My head is where I can see. What is that a metaphor for? 
Well, it turns out there is a metaphor for the actual psychological processes that predict whether or not your life is going to go downward or upward. In very large trials with thousands of people followed for years on end, this mental posture predicts bad outcomes as far as the eye can see. And this mental posture predicts a life that's moving up. Not because there's no challenges. If you live long enough, you're gonna get old. I'll let you get in on a clue, youngsters. I'm about to turn 70. If you live a long life, you're gonna have aches and pains. Heck, you're not in high school before you've been betrayed in relationships, maybe even earlier than that. I mean, you click through the things we struggle with, the psychological and social problems, they come with a thing called living. The issue is not, do you have pain? You will. The issue is, are you gonna deal with your pain like that? Or are you going to deal with it like that? And here's the problem. The same mode of mind that has given us the iPhones and has given us the solutions to disease is the one that tells us when pain shows up, you've got to run, you've got to fight, or you've got to hide. It treats your experiences as a problem to be solved. 65% of the suicide notes, our rates of suicide are not going down. Among young people, they're going up. Our rates are higher here than they are in Afghanistan, where people aren't sure what they're gonna eat tomorrow. 65% of the suicide notes say, when I'm dead, I won't hurt or they'll be sorry. So how do we connect with the fact that you have wisdom within, you know things that your mind doesn't know, meaning your analytic, judgmental, problem-solving mode of mind, when that mode of mind never will know, cannot know, So I want to argue that we can take this wisdom within if we can learn how to do something with that part of our mind and not let it rule the roost. It has a role, but it's only part of us. There's more to us, and we know it. And I want to argue that not only do your cultural and spiritual wisdom traditions orient you towards it, but it's built into human consciousness itself. We have, because of science and technology, made the problem worse in part because we've enormously expanded communication. We've expanded the ability to learn what's going on around the world and you don't have to open up your computer or turn on the television screen or look at your USA Today to find out that a whole lot of things are going on around the world that aren't so great. If something happened really horrible in the last 10 minutes, when we go out, you can see it on your iPhone. If somebody threw her baby across, off of a bridge, or there was a building that blew up in a terrorist attack, or some horrible thing happened somewhere, you'll be able to get it, maybe even see the video of it in minutes around the world. There's a flow of words and images, and what's inside those images is pain and suffering and difficulty. When I said, you're less likely to die as a result of violence, I bet you some of you thought, no, that's not true. There's more violence now. It's not true. You look at what we do with our children. We don't even let them play in parks. You could get arrested for not taking care of your children to do things that your parents did with you. Oh, just go down to the park. Come on back, dear, when you're ready. I used to spend hours in the canyons of El Cajon chasing rattlesnakes. I would leave in the morning with my friends. I'd say, bye, mom. She said, be, be back for dinner. You could be arrested for child endangerment. Now, because after there's people out there, there's things that get 
Do you know that the rate of those things is lower now than it was then? But we live with it behind our gates in our safe, walled off little place. We live with the horrifying images and a psychological world that seems unsafe to us. And then we do very unwise things with it. They're unwise even though they're logical, reasonable, sensible. The way that we're taught to adjust, and I got to say, these are my busting my friends. I even have my, my mentor up there. But, uh, you know, the shrinks are saying, let's look at the titles. You know, what are they selling? They're selling feel good. They're selling the idea that somehow you can solve your mental problems the way you solve dirt on the floor. You can use those problem solving strategies to just get rid of that. And it's not just the shrinks who are selling. <laughs> There's others who are selling. If you go out on the river and you carry some, catch some fish in many parts of the U.S., you, and you eat that fish, you just ate some antidepressants. The antidepressants don't get filtered out in the sewage system. They're in our rivers and streams. One out of four women were on antidepressants last year. One out of four. Antidepressants are only arguably successful and are still arguing about it for severe depression. I mean like vegetative signs. I mean like I can't move. If you don't believe that, you haven't looked at the meta-analyses. And that's, this is not a crazy psychologist. Go, go look at the American Medical Association uh, journals, major meta-analyses. And now we've got black box warnings. Warning, if you take antidepressants, you might become more suicidal. What? What? anti well. Because you're being sold a vision, just like you can sell Budweiser beer of out with the bad and in with the good, even if the data say no. There are school systems where a third of the kids are on Ritalin. And now we know on average they'll be two inches shorter at adulthood. Really? You want to, is that wise? And by the way, the effect size goes down with a year by the time you get five years out. It's very small. What the heck are we doing? We're pursuing that dream that we can solve our pains the way you solve dirt on the floor. It's not wise, it's not true, it never was true. And you just showed with your body that you know better. But your mind doesn't know better. When you have pain within, you're looking for the door. You're looking for the way out. Whether it's a pill bottle or something else. And we get this constant message that people are by their nature meant to be happy, happy, joy, joy faces. I saw a commercial years ago, maybe some of you may remember it was for Budweiser. And it had a bunch of young people having a night out and they're drinking Bud. And one by one, their heads went with a sound that went like this. They turned into smiley face buttons. So they're drinking and they got a smiley face button. Then the next, pretty soon they all have smiley face buttons. And then the, the line comes in that sells the beer. It's a bud night. I look at that and go like, huh? that's our model of happiness? You're going to become a smiley face button? It sells the beer. Somebody thinks that's pretty cool. I want to be a smiley face button. Here's my meth maker. This is the kindest way I can think about it. This is my little dude. He's now 11, little Stevie. I'm an old guy, but I'm around in round four. I've got kids that go from 48 to 11. I've had children in the home for 55 years without a break. If when this little dude goes to college, it takes multiple wives to do this, by the way, but uh, <laughs> they get tired of me and throw me out. It has nothing to do with me. But this is little Stevie. Can you see it? He's got a, he's got a little baseball cap on. It's to the side. How could you not look at that face and not think, it's just meant to be that we should be a smiley face button. He looks like a smiley face button. 
But we were all sweet babies like that. Our mamas would say, oh, you sweet baby. And that's what she saw. She didn't see people like we just found out her in the room. Dealing with stuff that go a long way back. And how back, far back they go, maybe not that age. But this is my little guy when he was five or six. And it turned out that he had a muscle disorder, which he still has. We put him in a karate class. This is a pretend cover. Sweet little guy. He couldn't do a push-up. If he ran from here to there with 10 kids, you could count to 10 before he'd get there. All the other kids would be waiting for him. He came home from kindergarten and looked at me crying. I said, what's going on, Stevie? And he says, they were picking kids for soccer teams and nobody wanted me. Ah, oh, dude. You know, welcome to the human condition. You're freaking five years old. And you already know something about human suffering and I can't protect them. You've seen it. The parents in here know. You want to, you can't. They're going to grow up and be like us. <laughs> we need something now in this world where we're constantly exposed to pain around the world. We need something that will help us find peace and purpose. And our spiritual and religious traditions, our wisdom traditions are on to a piece of it, but frankly, they need help now, I think. Things have weakened enough that we need help now from the behavioral scientists and the folks who are out there at the tables when you came in. And I, we are finding some things that connect with these deeper traditions. And I'm gonna start with some things that's really weird. I don't, I'm not showing you much data tonight. That, that's tomorrow. But this is a study done with chickens. And here was the basic thing. How do you get chickens to have peace in the hen house and still produce eggs? Most of the eggs you buy are caged raised birds. They're in pretty small cages, five, six, seven, eight, nine birds per cage. You can, you can buy the more expensive kind, of course, with the, with the, you know, with the wild uh, cage-free birds. But Here's the question that Bill Muir at, uh, at Purdue University asked. Would it be better to take the hens who lay a lot of eggs and let them reproduce over generations? After all, they're big layers. They should be able to do it. Or should we take entire cages and the cages that produce the most eggs, they can reproduce, even if it includes some hens who are not really layers of eggs should we allow the whole crew to reproduce you get this experiment and then you do that for six generations it's always the group that's succeeding or the individual that's succeeding after six generations here's what you get if you're in the ones where the selfish one wins the powerful one wins the one who's the best in the cage wins after six generations on average even though there are nine birds per cage this is what they look like they're featherless and they don't lay eggs. Why? Because they fight from morning till night. Why are there only three? They killed each other. They pecked each other to death. And they've been doing this for years, you know, because it's an obvious thing that the hens reproduce or laying. They now de-beak the birds. That's how they keep them, that from happening. They don't allow them to peck themselves to death. Here's what happens if you allow the whole cage to win and to reproduce. You got nine birds per cage. They got feathers. They lay a lot of eggs, but not all of them. Some of them are like peacemaker birds. They're like, bark, 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 bark. <laughs> but they have a place. They have a role. And they work together. Now, I just want you to think about yourself in the same way. What if it applies to the world within? What if you're like, a cage. Are there some badass birds in here that you've been feeding entirely too much chicken feed? And what chicken feed would they be feeding on? Your time and your attention. When you're giving your worries attention, you're feeding that worry. When you give your fears 
play over your behavior, you're feeding that fear. And have we actually created in this problem-solving mode of mind a situation in which we're looking like that first picture of a cage filled of selfish birds, of the particular parts within us that's saying, only me, whether it's the happy, happy, joy, joy vision, or that feeling that you get sometimes but not others that you can pursue only by alcohol or medications. I think problem solving has become a problem. I think the root of this tree is analytically, judgmentally figuring out. It's a wonderful thing where it works, but it doesn't work everywhere. Practical problem solving skills will give us things. If I said the doors are locked here, how the heck are we going to get out? You could probably come up with a way of getting out of here. Suppose I tell you they're all locked back there that you can see they're open, but let's say they weren't. How would we get out of here? Well, we might get together and beat out a door. Well, we might not be strong enough. We might call on a cell phone. Have we got reception? Is there a, if we could come up with only one strategy and vote on it and if it failed, we'd, they'd just find like a 200 skeletons in here uh, several months from now. I bet you we could come up with a pretty good plan to get out of here, couldn't we? Take that same skill and apply it to the world within, that's what you're doing. When you, for example, have a traumatic memory and your mind says, don't think about it. It tells you to hide from your own memories. If you can hide enough, maybe they won't come. That's logical, reasonable, sensible, and you showed me with your body, you know, pathological. You know that's not the strong place to stand, but your mind doesn't know it. And it never will. What your mind wants to do is subtract out your pains, your difficult memories, your difficult sensations. But your nervous system is like a calculator like this. It has a plus button. It has a multiplies button. It has an equal button. But if you look really, really close, you'll see it has no minus button. And it has no delete button. Is there a really painful memory that you've had? I mean, a really painful one, one that punches you that hurts even now to think about it, even if it's been many years, something you've done that's shameful or something that was done to you that was horrifying, some sort of traumatic inducing thing, event. Do you have one that's like that? that? You've been able to subtract from your life so thoroughly that it has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of your life. In fact, you can't even remember what it is. Do you have one like that? So far as you know, they don't exist. And guess what? They don't. As the old joke goes, short of a frontal lobotomy or a bottle in front of me, there's no delete <laughs> button. So problem solving says you're going to solve it by subtracting and getting it out, but that's not the kind of creature that we are. And yet, if you're Homer, you're trying not to think of donuts. And guess what? Have you ever done that in a diet? Don't think of it. You got a favorite food? Don't think of it. Pretty soon it's, I know there's stuff in the refrigerator. <laughs> because as you try to subtract it, you're reminding yourself of it. As you remind yourself of it, you're connected to it. If you tried really, really hard, I had to wire it up to a polygraph and I said, I'll tell you what, you have one simple job here, just be relaxed, but this polygraph will tell me if you're not. And just to motivate you, just to help you out a little bit, I have a 44 Magnum here. I'm going to hold your head. If you get nervous, I'm going to shoot you. But, so that should motivate you. Just relax. Guess what you get? Because that's the kind of creature that we are. I'm a person who struggled with panic and anxiety. That's why there's the work that I'm going to present to you today. And at my worst, my form of being like this was basically literally that. I can't have anxiety or I won't, yeah, yeah. Well, just that situation is enough to make you anxious. Anxiety became something to be anxious about. And that's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with these chronic problems. We have a built-in tendency, all living creatures do, to avoid 
something that's painful, but we're the only ones that can bring pain into any situation. If you had a traumatic car accident, just the word car will cause the blood to drain from your body. And where can you go that it won't be reminded? When I just said, if you had a traumatic car accident, in a group this large, somebody's had a traumatic accident. In a group this large, somebody's blood did drain from their body right now because an old bald guy made sounds. If you're a non-human animal, you know how to protect yourself, get away from the danger. Where are you gonna go to get away from the danger? Your mind's gonna follow you. And it will remind you of that accident or that shameful thing you did or that betrayal or that rape. You're gonna run from yourself, you better learn to run really fast. Because everywhere you go, there you are. And so this problem-solving mind gives you the impossible task of trying to avoid pain itself. And all we really do is we put it in a cage and we pretend it's not there. What's in these hands are secrets. Some folks raise their hands about things that they've told no one, not even their spouse. I guarantee you there are people in here who raise their hand with secrets that dark. What if the big joke is our secrets are the same secrets? We need to create a world in which we can deal with pain in a different way because we go from this feel-good agenda, the smiley face button agenda, which sort of seems superficially okay. And if we're going to feel good, we shouldn't feel bad. We then just start focusing on not feeling bad. And here's what the data show. Here's where you end up. It turns out you end up, you better not feel at all. We have data with socially anxious people who are highly avoidant of emotions that are around anxiety. Eventually, they become highly avoidant of happiness and joy. You think that's strange? You think that's odd? Oh, please. What happened when you were betrayed in love, and you all were? Your mind said, I will never be so vulnerable again. Vulnerable means woundable. I won't be woundable again. If someone's close to you, can they wound you? You think? You had this idea that way that you'd protect yourself is to not care about what you really cared about, which is intimate, loving relationships. I just won't feel at all. That'll solve the problem. 65% of the suicide notes say, when I'm dead, I won't hurt. That might be true, but it comes at a small little side effect. So here we are feeding our HPA axis, get, you know, why zebras don't get ulcers, squeezing down our life and putting life on hold, what we actually want in our life, taking these detours, avoiding and avoiding and avoiding, when really what we need to do, what behavioral science says we need to do is we need to learn to put our mind on a leash and to go from this problem-solving mode of mind being applied where it doesn't belong to a mode of mind that's more like a sunset. Maybe what we're looking at when we're looking at our history is not beautiful like that, but it is our history when we remember the losses that we've experienced or the pain that we've had. What I say to people sometimes just to get a sense of this. You got kids? Let's say they say yes. I say, I'll tell you what, I can magically remove your anxiety. Poof, it's gone. Here's the one little side effect, though, that I got to tell you about. When your children come to you and they talk to you about their fears, you will have no idea what they're talking about. You going to take that bargain? Dad? 
I have not many people who want to take that bargain. They want to know how pain works without knowing about pain. Good luck with that. There's things inside us that soften us and make us wiser that are a hard journey, that are a hard lesson. And so this feature here versus this feature here, you're looking at two faces, one of which is wiser than the other. Now the work that I do is called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, or ACT. Uh, there's a popular book out there, Get Out of Your Mind, that was mentioned, it's out. You know, but I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about the features of it and the science that it's based on, just a little bit, to give you a feel for it. I think I can do it in the 75 minutes that was promised. Uh, so that maybe you can see where I'm taking the behavioral science piece and some of our wiser part of us that you already reflected and trying to put them together in a way that we could put them into the modern world and find a way to resist this temptation to treat our lives only as problems to be solved. There's been a huge amount of explosion on work on ACT. This is the number of randomized trials. We developed it way back there. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, and this long flat spot is where we worked out the basic principles that I'm going to share with you today. So it kind of has exploded on the world, and it, it it's goes just about everywhere. You know, we've got, I, I was down at Rio and, and watched people win gold medals using ACT coaching. Can't tell you who they are because that's confidential, but I know they're coaches and I know what they're doing. Uh, you know, major industries, the BBC, Salesforce.com, Goldman Sachs, and so forth, done randomized trials and taking these methods, putting them into their management teams and so forth, and finding people who are less stressed, they stay longer, they're more committed to, and they create a more values-based uh, uh, and successful workplace. We've got data with stepping up to challenges like chronic pain, 13 randomized trials. We've got eating disorders, depression, anxiety, uh, is the challenges of uh, cancer and so forth, you can just let your eyes scan across it. And why? Because we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what is this versus what is this and how to put it into the human mind and human heart. And it turns out when you do that, that's empowering everywhere you go, whether it's running a business or showing up to a loss or dealing with anxiety or facing a physical illness. And the model that it's based on is called psychological flexibility. It has six features to it. I'm gonna tell you what they are and give you just a little bit of an example. So that when you leave here, maybe you have a sense as to whether or not you wanna explore this through the books and tapes and apps and of course even shrinks who are guided by this work, including people who are here in town. This is the overall model, the psychological flexibility model. It has six features. We usually organize them kind of into a hexagon like that. It's, it's kind of, I should, could have done it as a box, but you couldn't see it the other sides. But I always say it's like really one thing with six sides. They all interrelate, that's why the lines are there. And so I'm gonna go kind of one at a time and give you a tiny little thing, it's a tiny little example of each of them so that you can get a little bit of a feel of what I'm talking about. The claim I wanna make is that these are things that people do, psychological processes, that you can abstract from the best of our traditions. And then you can put them into the world in simpler ways, sometimes ways that take 30, 60 seconds. That's why I'm gonna do a few examples to give you a tiny little, tiny little window into what each of these six processes are. So here's the first two that we'll deal with. These are processes of intellectual and emotional opening. At the bottom is a made up word called defusion. We started out with deliteralization, which was also a made up word and I couldn't say it so we changed it to diffusion. It's not diffusion. Uh, and it's not, by the way, I looked at wiki, the wiki dictionary and said like defusing a bomb. I just went in and re-edited it because I can't have something like that. Fusion is when something is poured together. It's from a Latin word that means to pour. And what happens is, is your thinking gets poured together with what you're thinking about. And until we slow that down and learn to kind of watch our thoughts 
instead of just looking at the world structuring by our thoughts, we're gonna be had because the mind will walk us right into this automatic fight, struggle, hide or run agenda since in so many areas that agenda is powerful. So let's, we're gonna talk about these opening ones of diffusion and acceptance. Let's start with diffusion. This is an Emo Phillips to slightly changed quote, which I really like. I used to think my mind was my most wonderful organ. Then I realized which organ was telling me this. <laughs> the arrogance of the human mind, man, it'll tell you that it knows everything. It knows how to be happy, it knows how to love, it knows everything. No, it doesn't. It can just talk about everything. Do you know how to walk? Okay, with, just with your out loud voice, I want you to tell me how. Tell me how to walk. What should I do? I want to learn. And you know, you said you know, so just tell me. Shout it out so we can hear. What should I do? You willing to play? play? You will play with me? Thank you. Move my right foot. I know that's my right foot. Where should I move it? Forward. How do I do that? One foot forward. How do I do that? I don't know. You said you, do you really know? Yeah. Maybe somebody else here. Do you know when you're in rehab, I used to work in rehab, folks when they have to learn again, they literally yell at their legs. Their legs don't have ears. You didn't learn to walk that way. You watched a little baby. Do you know babies fall on average something like 200 times a day? You learn by trial and error. Your mind doesn't like that. It wants to know how. Now, you didn't learn it that way. Once you learned it, then you can control it by language. You've got within you the, the psychological equivalent of the Wizard of Oz. Commanding you as to what you should do. And we're down here saying, okay, okay. Go take the wicked witch of the west to bring me the broomstick. And then, I, you know, like, Bring me back relaxation and then I'll get rid of your anxiety. Okay, I'm going. Anybody got a pill? And yet that voice is the same voice that's giving us these rates of suicide and depression and anxiety and eating disorders, including in our own children. They're doing what the voice within tells them to do. That's the problem, not the solution. And we, we can show that. It's so easy to show. I'll give you a study that's, that's like stunning. It's like, can it really be like that? Okay. We bring people into the lab. We're going to see how much pain they can tolerate, physical pain. They have to put their hand on a hot plate, and it's not going to burn them, but it really is painful. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask them to walk around the room while reading a little slip of paper that they draw randomly out of a bag. Now, of course, we're evil psychologists, so all the slips in the bag say the same thing. <laughs> People don't know that. We've rigged that part. They all say the same thing. They take out what's there, whatever's there, and then while walking around the room, they read. And then as a result of that, their ability to tolerate pain goes up by 50%. What do you suppose we put in the bag as them, something for them to read that would do that? Dispose of, huh? Snow seeds. You, know, that, you might think it'd be something like, you can do it, Nike, you know? Uh, it's not gonna hurt that much. It doesn't really, hurt. it's not gonna damage you. Or here's what they're reading. It's hysterical to watch the films. What's written down is the words, I cannot walk around this room. I cannot walk around this room. I cannot walk around this room. And then 50% increase. This voice within tells you you can't do stuff that you can very easily. Okay, you wanna do it? Try really hard to focus on your mind that you can't touch the chair in front of you. Get it really clear in your mind that you can't. It's impossible, you can't do it. And then when it's really focused, while it's still saying that, 
touch the chair in front of you. Just do it. You can do that, right? You can do that. But wait a minute. I guarantee you, if I said, I'm going to change my speech here, I'm going to randomly draw somebody who's going to come up and talk for a couple minutes about uh, their life. Oh, sir, in the third row, I went, you know, some people, I really thought I was doing it. Your blood would be draining from your body. and You're saying, I'm not going to do it. I'm not doing it. I can't do that. No, I can't do that. Come up and sing. Oh, I don't sing. Come on. I don't, oh, I don't dance. <laughs> the voice will tell you, in the end, will tell you to the point that you can't love, you can't play, you can't contribute, you can't do much of anything. Man, I work with clients who live their life in their bathroom. Because that voice within took their lives down that small. And you just showed how thin the cage is. It's like a cage made out of rice paper. That voice within does not have power over you other than the illusion that's in that movie. And when you can pop that illusion that easily, when you can pull the curtain aside, and just like in that movie, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, you humbug. Yes, I am humbug. You're an evil man. No, no, dear. I'm a very good man. I'm just a very bad wizard. It's like that. You humbug mind. You evil mind. No, no, I'm actually a very good mind. I'm just a very bad dictator. This mind of yours didn't evolve to run a whole human life. It evolved to solve problems, external problems, like not being able to eat, or going from one place to the next, or solving disease, or helping us live longer, or being able to communicate. And guess what? It solved those problems. It's our problem if we're giving it problems to solve that it didn't evolve to solve. That's actually a sentence that makes sense. Write it down. <laughs> and we can respectfully pull the curtain aside and withdraw the instructions. Stop asking your analytic, judgmental mind to know how to love, to know how to be at peace, to know how to care, to know how to reach out to others. It doesn't know how to do that. It knows how to judge and predict and evaluate and compare. And does that sound like a loving space? Does that sound like a peaceful place? But you have within you wisdom that will guide you to a loving and peaceful place. It's just not in that voice. How about acceptance of feelings? That's the other one. Acceptance isn't tolerance, it isn't resignation. In a way, I wish I'd come up with a better word, but it's the best I could come up with. But it comes from a Latin root, septeri, that means to receive, and the original connotation in Latin was to receive as if to receive a gift, here. Now, we still have that in English. We say, here, will you accept this? When we've been visited by pain or a difficult memory, there's a gift inside that that life is asking us to receive. Let's say somebody very close to you has died. Very close, perhaps unexpectedly. How could there be a gift inside there? Well, how about this? In your pain, you will find the love that you have for that person. You will be reminded of it. Every time you feel that pain, if you dig a little deeper, you will find it. That's a gift. It's not a gift coming the way you'd like it. But to say no is to say no to all of it. Imagine that you had a sheet of paper where you had to write down what was in this hand 
that had to do with the emotional or memories or things that life is asking you to accept. Write it down mentally. Take the thing that was in your hand, write it down. And now flip it over and ask this question. What's the gift that's inside it? If it was a betrayal, it's probably yearning for trust and intimacy. Is that your enemy? If it was a loss, it's probably how dear that was to you. Is that your enemy? If it's something you did that's shameful, what's on the flip side of it is, I want to be a person who lives my life like this. Is that your enemy? Do you know that guilt actually predicts positive outcomes in human beings? Shame doesn't because you get this piece of I'm bad. But that's the voice within telling you the story as to why you did it. Now let's just see if we can touch this really quickly. What I'd like you to do is just kind of look around the room with two different mentalities. In one case, I want you to sort of look and when you see features or you know, architectural things and so forth, I want you to mentally say no. These chairs, oh please. You paid a designer to design that? Really? That person's hairdo over there? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> say no. Whatever you see, say no. And then flip it now. Look around, and whatever you see, say yes. Now go inside yourself and do the same thing. Find a sensation, a memory, a feeling, a thought. Probably some of those things that were in that hand. And mentally say, no, I can't, I won't. It's invalid. It somehow needs to go away. And I'll flip it and look at the same thing and say, yes. It belongs. It's part of me. It's not the whole of me. And maybe even there's a gift inside it. You with me on this? Could you feel the difference? You can learn to put that in your life in a habitual way. Learning to say yes to emotions, yes to memories. Not turning your life over to it. That's not what I'm talking about. As they are, not as what they say they are. Of acknowledging your own experience as something that is part of a whole valid human experience. These ones in the center, these are being aware in the moment and conscious. The present moment is where we live. The past and the future, Alan Watts, are illusions. They exist in the present, which is all there is. What we need to learn is how to be more flexibly attentive to what's present. We live there all the time. But at our problem-solving mode of mind, we disappear into the past and future. If you suddenly found yourself in this room and you didn't know how you got here, you just plopped down here, you were going out to get some groceries and suddenly you're sitting where you are, I bet you you'd be thinking about two things and two things only. How the hell did I get here? And how do I get out? You'd go past and you'd go future. That's problem solving. You try to solve the problem of why am I here? It's a problem solving mode of mind. When people are in struggling with anxiety, depression, substance use, etc., they're doing the same thing. How the hell did I get here? How the hell do I get out? And often miss what's right inside that experience that would actually give them a way, but it wouldn't be a way out, it would be a way in. In that posture, I'm with what's present. In this posture, I have to get out of what's present. So learning how to come into the present way that's flexible, fluid, and voluntary, not like your teenager looking at a video screen, that's being in the present, but that's not what we're talking about. So I'm going to give you just a quick little exercise to give you an example. 
I want you just to focus on the soles of your feet, but I want you to start out picking your right foot. And just be aware of the sole of your right foot. Like knowing exactly where it begins and ends, where the edges are. There are some places that are probably a little warmer than others or a little under pressure than others or sort of feel different than others. Can you notice it in your right foot? Now notice it in your left foot. Same thing's true in your left foot. Focus on that. Your foot has a shape. You can feel it from the inside. It has particular sensations that are there in the soles of your feet. Notice that they're different. It's not all one thing. The ball of your foot is a little different than your heel. Your toes are a little different than your arch. Now notice that you have two feet. You got two soles of your feet. Expand your awareness out so that you can feel both at the same time. Just like taking a little flashlight and one of those little ones that have a little twisty thing where the beam goes out broader, I want you to notice that you have two soles of your feet. Simple, right? That's the exercise. If you teach developmentally disabled children that exercise, their fights on the schoolyard go down by about 50%. I'll show you the data. When you get out there and you're in, that's not fair, focus on the soles of your feet. We talk about being grounded, don't we? We talk about being humble, that means feet in the dirt. Humus, dirt, humble. Following the breath, of course, probably many of you in here are meditators, but all I'm pointing to is this attentional flexibility of being able to focus on this or focus on this or focus on this, just knowing you can do that gives you the capacity when something's coming up and the voice is saying, you have to do this. You say, thank you, mind very much for that. Uh, I'm focusing on this. That's why meditation and mindfulness is everywhere you can go. I mean, it's just gone into the modern world because people need some help as dealing with the cacophony and attentional flexibility is part of that help. I promised here that human consciousness would be kind of a link to this and I'm gonna do a little exercise and bring a couple things together and then we'll, we'll probably go, I said, I said 75, that's at 75. I think I need 10 more, is that okay? Okay. Here's this hexagon faced a different way. Imagine that the hexagon's like a shield and you're behind an 18-wheeler and it's uh, been raining and it's kicking dirt up on the windshield and you can't see very well. Metaphorically, if you're over there on avoidance and buying into what the voice says, it's kind of like a windshield wiper that's stuck. The hinge point here is human consciousness. It's being this perspective-taking skill of being a person behind your eyes. From there, as you open up with looking at your thoughts, being more open to your emotions, you can come into the now and move over to the parts of the model we haven't got to yet of where you care and what are you gonna do. And for that little moment, that windshield clears. The hinge is consciousness itself. I'm gonna try to prove that to you uh, with a, a, a little exercise, but I'm gonna move it out to the end since I've Got a little bit of time issue. I'm going to combine a couple things. So let's see if I can rise to this promise in a minute. But I first want to get the left, the, the right side of this model out. If we no longer are running away, if we're here and showing up, then there's another issue, which is what are we going to be up to in our life? Many of us spend our lives trying to run and, hide and fight, run and fight and hide. At the point at which we're here, we can focus our lives on what do we want to bring into our lives that reflects qualities of being and doing that we care about. One of the biggest predictors of whether or not people's lives are going to move positive or negative is do they know what their values are and are they building their lives around them? We get relatively little encouragement about that. Uh, sometimes even in our healthcare system. <laughs> Inside the kind of subtractive agenda that commonly settles into the modern world, searching for the delete button. And because of that, we can't 
build these values-based journeys of one at a time walking out into our lives. And so here's a little exercise that I wanted to do to kind of, well, close out or get close to closing out. What I, what I want you to do is take this thing that is down there in, uh, was in your hands, and I, I want you to ask yourself this question. And then we'll do a little eyes closed exercise, and I think bring this to a close. If you could pick an advisor, somebody who's empowered you in some way, who might be able to help you with how to be with yourself with whatever was in that hand. Could be a therapist or a spiritual leader or a friend or a spout or could be anybody. But if you could pick an advisor, somebody who's wise, could be a grandma or a grandpa or a, could be anyone, a coach or who would you pick who could give you a little bit of uplift and encouragement as to how to be a whole human being, even with this issue that we just established is both painful and long lasting, been around a long time. Have you got somebody? Could you think of someone? Would you be willing to do a little eyes closed exercise just to pull these pieces together? What I'd like you to do is just put your stuff where things are gonna be comfortable and not fall down, won't be gone very far. Just a few minutes. And what I want you to do is to start out with this thing that was in your hand. And I want you to first find it somewhere in your body. See if you can kind of go inside yourself metaphorically and take this difficult combination of issues and go find it and we're gonna kind of almost like put it in your lap. And I asked you to pick someone who will help you with that. But I first want you to notice who's noticing that. That thing that's in your lap, that collection of emotions and history and bodily sensations, memories, thoughts, judgments, is not noticing itself. There's a human being called you who's behind those eyes of yours. And I just want you for a, note, a second to notice that you're noticing what's there in your lap. And then I want you to go and find that advisor that you decided you're going to pick. And I want you to imagine now that right in front of you is the face of that person. And I want you just to kind of Spend time, just a moment, looking at that face. As if we have the face of that person right here in front of you, kind of floating there. And see that person's expression and their skin and allow their eyes to be open and imagine that you're looking right at them. What do you see there in those eyes of that person? And then I want you to imagine being that person looking back at you. You now are looking up at yourself, looking down. And ask yourself the question of what does that advisor that you picked see looking at you? Does he or she see a whole human being, a, being that, a human being that belongs here? Are you a worthwhile person, a lovable person? What does that, that guide, that advisor you pick, see there when he or she looks at you? Knowing full well, you picked an advisor to help you with what's in your lap. That guide or advisor knows what's there, knows that thing that happened. If there was one thing that that guide or advisor could say to you that might be helpful to you in dealing with that, what might it be?
and then we'll be back behind your eyes looking back at that advisor but remembering what it is that was said and then we'll allow the advisor to go away but remember you're here with that thing that you're struggling with for a long time we established that that's on your lap and then mentally what I want you to do is imagine still with your eyes closed going to one side or the other of this auditorium and from there I want to add one more thing I want you to see yourself still sitting in that chair where you are but now from the distance you know what's going on inside that person and you know the struggles that that person called you has had and you know that there's this painful thing in the lap and my question of you is what do you feel about that person you're looking at do you see a whole human being a lovable human being a person who is valid you know what's in that lap of yours but from the other side of the room looking do you see a person who belongs here and as you begin to answer I want you to notice this person is in a group of people every single one of them is right now aware of something painful that at their worst puts them towards that fetal position of running and fighting and hiding you are not alone as a human being dealing with issues like this do you belong here in this group are you one of us and then come back over we'll come back to the chair but as you come over I want you just to ask yourself this if there's anything you could say to yourself that might be of help to you that might help you move from a place of you at your worst to you at your best from this perspective as you kind of walk back towards yourself what might you want to say and then we'll come back to yourself we'll flip around will come into your body and into your chair but remembering the advice that your guide gave you and remembering the advice that came to you looking at yourself from afar and then when you're ready you can open your eyes and so here's my question to you and I if you'd be willing just to share a couple not about the painful piece but just what did your guide or yourself say to yourself about how to be with yourself about things that are hard and difficult? Anybody want to just call out a, a phrase or a sentence? How can you, yeah. Uh, my mentor said slow down. Slow down. Let it go. Let it go. Love, it. Hmm? Love it. You're not alone. You can leave it. Be kind. Here's the deal. Do these sound like wise words? They sound to me like people at their best. And they don't sound to me like people doing this. They sound to me like people doing that. So what I just want to leave with you is the science of psychological flexibility says that when you're open, when you're aware, then you can connect with the possibility of caring and being and doing. And that you already know what the science of psychological flexibility is showing and what is in our wisdom traditions and our cultural traditions at their best. But the thing that you've got to face is that booming voice within doesn't know it and it never will because this sunset of mode of mind is not life as a math problem. The reason why we've done what we've done in the modern world has come from the great success we've had with problem solving. But we've got to put that mind of ours on a leash. 
This is my mother. She died a couple of years ago. She was 93. And whenever I give a talk, I look at her picture and I ask her how I should do this. And I looked in while I was preparing for this talk and I asked my mama what she should do, what I should do. This woman suffered so Im uh, immensely. She's uh, Jewish by the maternal line and her father became a Nazi sympathizer. She was told things like, don't tell people you have tainted blood. And yet she found inside her the ability Years ago in the 50s, when they would talk about gays and lesbians, she'd say, don't judge people, dear, don't judge people. That came out of her suffering. That was why she could say those wise words to me. What she said about this talk is, be yourself, dear. Be yourself. I think we have wisdom within that will help us our children have wisdom within that will help them. If we can rein in the excesses of this analytic, judgmental mode of mind that we've turned loose on the world that's done so much wonderful things for so many things, but it is just not going to give us a whole healed human heart. We can find a way to have both. I hope I've been of some use to you. And uh, I hope I've served you in some way. But thank you for being here.